It is really my great honor and privilege to introduce to you this morning a very extraordinary leader, the Honorable, the Right Honorable Kim Campbell. My challenge, obviously, as I've already stated, is to do justice to such a successful and extremely diverse and prolific career in such a short introduction, I promise. Whether as a member of parliament, a minister, a professor, a tireless champion for Canada, Ms. Campbell has demonstrated wit, intelligence, and leadership in all of her public incarnations. She has spoken widely about issues related to leadership, democracy, politics, climate change, Canada-US relations, and a subject very dear to me, gender equality. Ms. Campbell was born in Port Albany, British Columbia, and she could have decided to pursue a career as a public broadcaster as she was seen on TV in 1957 doing interviews. But being the wise person that she turned out to be even at a very young age, she decided to pursue higher education. And so therefore, she obtained her law degree from the University of British Columbia. And she studied at the London School of Economics and later in her career, lectured at the John F. Kennedy School of Government at Harvard University. Throughout her years in public life, she has developed a reputation for speaking her mind and she has built up an impressive and inspiring list of credentials along the way. And something that I will talk about this afternoon, I think that she has demonstrated political courage. She was the first woman to lead the Progressive Conservative Party of Canada, the first woman to head Veterans Affairs, and the first woman to be Minister of Justice. She was also the first woman to be a Minister of National Defense, not only in Canada, but amongst all of the NATO Alliance countries. Last September, Ms. Campbell was honored by the Famous Five organization in Ottawa. As you well know, the five Alberta women who have come to be known as the Famous Five were instrumental in fighting for women's rights in Canada. And these, these women took their challenge to the ultimate court in Britain where they successfully won the right for women to vote. This was 1929. 54 years later, Ms. Campbell became the Right Honorable Kim Campbell. As Louise McKinney, one of those famous five, once said, the purpose of a woman's life is just the same as the purpose of a man's life, although maybe not exactly. <laughs> that she may make the best political contribution to the generation in which she is living. And I think certainly Ms. Campbell has demonstrated that in spades. From 1999 to 2003, Ms. Campbell was the chair of the Council of Women World Leaders. She was also a founding member of the Club of Madrid, an organization of former democratic presidents and prime ministers from around the world. In 1996, she was named for a four-year term as counsel to Los Angeles. In 2008, Ms. Campbell was named to the Order of Canada for her distinguished contributions to Canadian politics and her active involvement in the leadership and promotion of global democracy, international cooperation, and women in politics. Today, she is a founding principal of the, for the Peter Lockheed Leadership College here at the University of, Bal of Alberta, which is dedicated to promoting the principles of leadership. And I, for one, look forward very much to our leaders of the future being instilled with the importance of our democratic rights. Ms. Campbell will be talking today about subjects of particular interest to us, access and privacy rights, as a fundamental building block to democracy in Canada. As she stated in 2005 at a conference organized by the Club of Madrid, democracy is the, is the very best context for human development, for the capacity to live freely and explore one's human potential. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in giving a warm welcome to our distinguished guest, the Right Honorable Kim Campbell. Good morning. Thank you very much, Commissioner Legault. 
Um, I'm delighted to be here, um, although I'm a little intimidated because, um, first of all, I could never say no to Bill Connor when he asked me to do something. Uh, he's become a great friend and certainly a great supporter of the work we're doing to create the Peter Lawhey Leadership College. But I realize that I'm standing before you. You are a group of experts, and I really don't have anything to tell you about privacy and access that you don't already know, and that isn't, in fact, an integral part of your lives as you lead them. So trying to figure out what I, I as a labor... Now, if this were 25 years ago when I was the freshly min, minted Minister of Justice, uh, as I was at the time, I would arrive here with a wonderful lawyerly presentation, probably about the state of the law, which was much younger then, since the, uh, at the federal level, our privacy and access laws came into effect at the same time at, as the equality provisions of the Charter of Rights and Freedoms around 1983. So it would still be, have been quite young then. And I would probably have talked a lot about uh, current policy. Maybe I would have uh, given you an explanation and uh, learned uh, defense of Bill C-51. Or maybe not, I don't know. <laughs> um, but the point is, um, I respect very much that uh, if I'm going to say anything useful today, it will have to be uh, as what I am today, which is uh, a former uh, policymaker, but somebody who has uh, observed many of these things uh, and these issues uh, more broadly. So not even so much a bird's eye view as maybe a plane's eye view. Um, this afternoon, I will be getting on a plane uh, to, to go to Paris, where I will be engaged in an event uh, dealing with uh, the Iranian opposition. And uh, I will then, uh, I just recently I was in Kiev where I chaired the steering committee of the World Movement for Democracy and I chaired a foundation in Kiev for, for five years. I will be going off to, to London uh, after the Paris meeting uh, for a, a meeting of the board of the International Center for the Study of Radicalization and Political Violence. Um, all of these activities that I do give me the opportunity to see uh, the reality of tyranny the reality of non-democratic institutions, the reality of societies where the protection of privacy and the guarantee of access to information are still dreams, are still things that people uh, yearn to have. And they really are in incredibly important foundations of, the, of democracy because they are such an integral part of the rule of law. And what is the rule of law? The rule of law doesn't just mean having laws. All dictatorships have lots of laws. The point is, is to have laws that bind all people from the highest to the lowest and that guarantee the rights of all people from the highest to the lowest. So, I, you are the experts, I am not. And I actually also thought of making the subtitle of my talk, uh, Everything I Know About Access and Privacy I Learned from Television, because I'm going to make some reference. This, is, this would be a great amusement to people who know me well, because I'm known as not being a very, a very good television watcher. And people will say, oh, did you see this? And you see that? And you know, and I look at People magazine, I haven't a clue who any of the people are. But um, my sister lives in Victoria. and. I discovered when I visited her that she had this wonderful gizmo that enabled her to record television shows. And uh, I have just moved back to Canada uh, last year I, this, to come back. I had lived out of Canada since 1996. And now that I have a place in Vancouver and a place in Edmonton, I actually have television sets that record programs. So I'm becoming a whole new person and getting all sorts of knowledge from watching TV shows. Uh, and I'll make some reference uh, to that uh, in the course of my remarks. But, Let's, let's get to this question of, of privacy and access. In 2009, uh, Chief Justice Beverly McLaughlin, who incidentally was my contracts professor at law school and then later taught me advanced evidence, so it's been quite wonderful to, uh, to follow her and uh, we've main, remained in touch all these years. Um, and uh, she plays an interesting role in all of these issues. But she spoke about the, the issues of privacy and access and uh, made the point that the legislation that created our rights to uh, the federal level access to information and the protection of privacy were treated by the Supreme Court of Canada as what she called quasi-constitutional statutes, which means that the interpretive uh, rules, the interpretive approach given to uh, judging, adjudicating cases brought under those statutes were the same interpretive principles brought to adjudicating constitutionally uh, protected rights, which is to say that the protection is construed broadly the exceptions are construed narrowly. The problem is with access to information and privacy, these are very often two rights that find themselves in conflict in individual 
individual cases. And so the problem is which of the rights is going to be construed broadly, which of them is going to be construed narrowly in the case. So uh, that's why they get paid the big bucks up there at the Supreme Court of Canada, because it is a very difficult challenge often to balance the rights of access with the rights of privacy. So the, the challenges that she described in this issue, this was the first one, the balance. The second challenge that she identified was the challenge of technology, and of course the extent to which uh, technology ha has changed. And thirdly, the challenges of security. And these are the, the, the kind of organizing principles I want to touch a little bit today in talking about, about the, the issue before us. Um, today, uh, the balance between uh, access and privacy uh, it is very interesting. It, it, it raises a lot of interesting questions. And first of all, we have this question of private, what is private versus what is secret? Privacy is actually a fairly recent uh, concept. And uh, scholars argue that it has really been a concept that has come up through the Anglo-American legal tradition. Uh, I have a home in France. The French do not have a word for privacy. On a des choses privées, but privacy as such is not a concept. Uh, I also was a Soviet scholar, and it won't surprise you to know that Russian also has no word for privacy. More is the pity. Um, uh, but I think although there was this notion of things that were private, uh, but, but this concept of privacy itself as something that adheres to a person that is a right is not something that's part of, uh, of, of universal cultural understanding. Long before we had the inter internet, privacy could also be very limited. Uh, people who lived in small communities where everybody knew everyone's business did not necessarily have a, a particularly high expectation of privacy. And uh, you know, the, the people often wanted to keep secrets and, and what was the relationship between privacy and secrecy? Well, why did people want to have privacy? Well, they wanted to avoid social opprobrium. That could be because they were doing naughty things, or it could be because they were doing unconventional things, or they were doing things that may uh, have offended somebody, or they were just doing things that they thought were nobody else's business. We also concern about, are concerned about privacy, privacy in terms of corporate exploitation. If corporate interests know what we're doing, does that give them an opportunity to exploit us in some way, to make use of what they know about us, to manipulate us, to influence us? Whatever, and the other uh, interesting aspect about privacy is its relationship to security. Uh, that some of our information can be used by criminals, and uh, that they can, whether it's the information, the codes to our bank accounts, or uh, information about things that 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 we buy, things that that uh, that people want to steal from us, where we are. You know, if people can follow us everywhere, if we have our GPS on and people know where we are, or, or people who foolishly announce on Facebook that they're going off to a long holiday and they're sort of like, why don't you come and rob my house while I'm away? Um, and let me show you this lovely picture of my art collection, which, <laughs> and it's over here and the dog won't bark if you give him a bone, whatever. Um, and the other concern, of course, is the extent to which a state may use private information to be oppressive. And one of the things I think that is important is, is to understand how, that, that how we see privacy is very much related to this question of how we are governed and how we, who exercises power and how we see limits on it. Now, an expert on privacy, Steve, Steve Rambaum, Baum, recently said, privacy is dead, get over it. And I was interested when I saw this because Rambam is actually one of the names by which one of the great Talmudic scholars, Moses Maimonides, was known. Moses Maimonides, who wrote The Guide to the Perplexed. And I sort of had this vision of somebody coming to see the great rabbi and saying, great rabbi, you know, we have this problem, how do we protect privacy and yet respect the right of people to know and everything, and, and the rabbi saying, you know, well, privacy is dead, get over it. Um, or somebody climbing the mountain to the cave of the great guru and asking the same question, the great guru saying privacy is dead, get over it, because it seems very, very blunt and very um, unnuanced as an expression. And the real question is, is that true? Is privacy dead? I think privacy is certainly very much narrowed from what it was, but I'll go on to, to say about that, that I think that it still is a relevant concept and it's still, it's not uh, totally um, uh, irrelevant or, 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 or dead. It may be uh, you know, on life support. Uh, but one of the things that we find interesting is the redefinition of privacy, what people think is private. 
And you know, one of the advantages of getting old, there aren't many, but one of them is that you do get a sense to sort of see the, the, the span of history. And certainly for people of my generation, I'm a post-war baby boomer. And incidentally, when I was on TV in 1957, I was a kid. <laughs> I, you know, otherwise, I'd, be, I'd look like Larry King if I weren't, but anyway. Um, <laughs> But, uh, but it is, but it, you know, it, 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 there, are, there are changes which are really, really amazing. And one of the things that's so interesting is the way the concept of privacy has changed. Uh, modern media, reality shows, the things that people are prepared to show about themselves. There was a time when filmmakers uh, were very controversial. There was a famous film about a family in California, and I can't remember the name of it, but the filmmakers went in and they actually filmed this family in their house. And, uh, and there were sort of all sorts of interesting challenges in their lives. And many people thought that this film, while on the one level was a wonderful work of art, was unacceptably intrusive. It bothered people to be breaching the privacy of these people. Nowadays, you know, whether it's Keeping Up with the Kardashians, and no, my new television habits do not include watching Keeping Up with the Kardashians. I have, you know, some taste. But people go on TV and reality shows and are prepared to reveal things about themselves that are absolutely mind-boggling. Social media, we are very concerned that young people seem to feel they should reveal all of their private information on Facebook. Uh, I was gonna say on Twitter, although I'm on Twitter, but I'm told now that only old people do Twitter, so. Uh, <laughs> but whatever, whatever the, the, the new social media du jour is, that, that people are, 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 are giving away information about themselves. Uh, and our, our generation is very concerned about what kids put on, on Facebook. And the interesting thing is, we know that today employers go onto Facebook and they look at things that people say about themselves and the pictures they take of their drunken parties and you know, you know, the things that they do and you know, Prince Harry in the nude in, in Las Vegas and it doesn't seem to hurt him. Uh, but the interesting thing is how will these, this generation of young people who have been willing to reveal themselves and all that, that entails um, on social media, how will they look at this when they are themselves employers? I mean, are we really redefining privacy and what people think is acceptable to make public? The fact that people make sex tapes, and now, you know, Paris Hilton's very concerned about that shit of sex tape, and it was launched, it was shown on the internet, and of course, you know, in the old days it would come over a transom and be published in the papers, now it can go viral. And so very concerned about that, but to me, the idea of even making a sex tape to begin with. Um, I remember when I was running for the leadership that my, um, Chief of Staff said to me, uh, Kim, I've heard that maybe there are some nude photos of you. And I just laughed and I said, I have never had the kind of body that I wanted to immortalize in a nude photo. So don't worry, of all the indiscretions I've committed in my life, trust me, unless somebody was standing outside my bedroom window looking through my curtain, there are no nude photos of me. But you know, I may be the only you know, living person who doesn't have nude photos of herself on the internet. So th this notion of you know, what is private, you know, is it, it, changing. And that may also reduce the vulnerability of having one's privacy breached. If we aren't shockable anymore, if, if we can, I mean, I'm shocked by that Paris Hilton is so dumb, but nobody seems to be concerned, oh, there's sex on, on uh, the, you know, uh, you know. Uh, will we watch professional porn or will we watch Paris Hilton? I don't know, I mean, we can probably see the professional porn better so we don't need to watch her, but anyway. But there are other things as well. I mean, much of our privacy is involved with you know, our bodily functions, for example. And this is also a very cultural thing. We like to have private restrooms. And, you, you know, and you know, Marilyn Monroe once was visiting the family of Arthur Miller, her husband. And uh, she went to the, to the bathroom and she was sort of shy about being over here. So she turned the tap on. Uh, and uh, you know, to cover up the sound of her going tinkle, tinkle, tinkle in the bathroom. And uh, when she came out, uh, Arthur Miller's uh, mother, who was a nice old Jewish lady, said to, her, to him, uh, she pees like a horse because she thought the tap was on because anyway. <laughs> but the point is, the point is, there are things that we think are, are private. But there's a very interesting book by a woman called Rose George, who's a wonderful writer, and I recommend her for all the things that she writes about. But she wrote a book called The Big Necessity, which is about Poo. It's about going to the bathroom. It's about sanitation. 
uh, which is actually an extremely important issue. In fact, I once was at a, a philanthropy uh, conference in Singapore. This is opening a square bracket here, as they say in the diplomatic service. And a man, I, I came in late to this meeting, there was a man sitting next to me. And he said, uh, I'm, I think his name is somebody Chung, I'm the president of the WTO. And I was about to say, and I'm Maria of Romania, when he gave me his card. And he was president of the WTO, but it wasn't the WTO, I know it was the World Toilet Organization. <laughs> Because this man had some money and he wanted to start a philanthropy and he decided, looking at the problems of the world, that one of the biggest problems in the world was sanitation. And it is a big problem. Why don't girls go to school in some places? Because there's no safe place for them to go to the bathroom. They are either physically vulnerable or there's just no privacy for them, all these terrible things. So, and, and in the, the, um, the, the, the big necessity, Rose, Joyce talk, Rose George talks about all of these parts of the world where open defecation is the norm. Now, aside from the sanitation questions, this certainly suggests a whole different concept about what is private and what isn't. So in some degree, what we can make private, what, what we do make private depends on what we can make private. And we define our concepts of what is private, what is public, and therefore what we are vulnerable in terms of having revealed about ourselves in those contexts. And so the interesting question comes, many of the things that we think of as being private or private information, do they still need to be private? Are we vulnerable if they are disclosed? Um, if our health uh, uh, details are disclosed. Does that make us vulnerable because we can't get health insurance? Well, maybe not in a country where the regulations prohibit discrimination based on, in offering health insurance based on the situation of, of your health. So it's a very interesting question. What is private? Really depends on a lot of external factors, and these external factors change. Some of them are social mores and norms. Some of them are regulatory constructs that affect the way information can or cannot be used against us. Um, access to information, uh, of course, refers, we, we think, fundamentally about citizens and government. But there are also other aspects of this. I'll come back to the, to the, the citizens government one in a minute. But we also know that access to information has great impact on corporate interests, um, data mining for research. So sometimes, I mean, this morning there was a very interesting article uh, I can't even remember where I saw it, New York Times or someplace, about uh, a, a research that had been done uh, on, on me metadata of people who take, uh, what is it, pro, um, anti, uh, anti, uh, anti acid uh, medicines like Prilosec and Nexium, uh, proton pump inhibitors, I think they're called, and on an analysis of, I think, uh, something like 11 million uh, data sets and uh, affecting over a million people, they found that there was a, a, a correlation or an increased risk of heart attack for people who take protein pump inhibitors. And it's a very interesting example of how a large amount of data uh, can be analyzed. Now, they, they didn't say you should immediately stop taking these things. The increased risk was, was not huge. But this kind of analysis and this access to the kind of data that doctors put in simply by virtue of doing prescriptions, things come into records, uh, and they enable us to look at things that if we were to set out to try and collect that that data manually or you know, interacting with each doctor or through clinical trials uh, would be prohibitive. So there are many ways in which access to information, access to data uh, bases about uh, person, personal information can be very, very useful. There are also uh, ways in which they uh, serve corporate interests. Uh, Amazon ads, and it's kind of eerie sometimes when I go online and I, in my Kindle, I buy a book and then they're recommending other books. And sometimes they get my interest right, sometimes they're sort of off the wall. Um, but unless we are, our credit card records, which leave a record of what we are, what we are buying, unless we are off the grid, our consumer choices are not private. Um, and as I say, our medical information may be part of a database. Usually it's not identified to the individual person, so we don't feel it's a threat to our, uh, to our, uh, our own personal interests, our privacy interests. It's also important to point out that the free internet is not free. 
I mean, the reason why we can go online and do all of these things, and sometimes we do have to pay to subscribe or to get, get a service, but all of those things that are free aren't really free, that they are paid for by advertising, by some kind of economic relationship. And it's taken a long time for people to sort out the business model of the internet. But I think we have to understand that this is a relationship we create with this incredible network of information, and sometimes we have to pay, and sometimes what we pay with is our eyes looking at an ad or the ability of some advertiser to get information on our buying preferences. Is that a problem? I don't know. I hear about, you know, this, um, this notion of having personalized billboards and, you know, walking down the street and by virtue of what, I guess, your cell phone or whatever you're carrying, they read your, your consumer preferences and there will be a billboard. And this reminds me of uh, an episode of The Good Wife I saw some time ago where uh, there was a case where somebody was complaining that their, their intellectual property and the film they'd created had been stolen and had been put unauthorized on a website and, and that this was, and then this question was, well, that's not damaging to you. Well, it is damaging because look, it's, it's been put up on a website next to porn sites. And then they discovered that the reason why the porn sites were coming up was that one of the senior partners in the law firm, uh, who was none too fastidious on these issues, had been uh, searching porn sites. And so when the computer went on, the uh, very uh, obliging uh, uh, network uh, produced more ads for things that, you know, and you might also like to see, which had given the impression that this thing was being shown. So the idea that he might be walking down the street and personalized bills, billboards, you know, who knows what they would show. <laughs> So, um, but the other thing I want to say is that access to information is also not free. Um, in under two, I think in 2011 figures, the Canadian government said that, that access to information uh, cost about $41 billion, of which only 1% is recovered by user fees. And I think this is important, and I want to raise a, a, a personal incident that I was part of when I was Canadian Consul General in Los Angeles. My husband and I've been together now for 18 years, but at that time it was a bit scandalous because he's much younger than I am and he's a, quite a remarkable person. But if I said to him, if we want to live together, you have to live with me in this house because it's part of my job and I, you know, I can't move out of the consular residence. Also, Canadian diplomats pay rent for their houses and the amount of rent you pay depends on the number of people who are in your family. So I had to disclose that he was living with me so that I would be paying the appropriate rent for the house. Well, after about a year or so, some Canadian journalist decided to do an access to information request to the Canadian consulate in Los Angeles, and I don't know, maybe even to the Department of Foreign Affairs in Ottawa, to see whether my husband, Hershey Felder, had been paid any money by the government. So it actually kind of shut everything down for about two days. I mean, it took a long time to get all of the, to go through all of the accounts and all of the information from the time that he and I had started living together. And of course, what they found in looking at all of these things was, ha ha, he had been written a check for $97. Why had he been written a check for $97? Because a guy had come to the house to fix the oven, and even though the manager of the consulate had negotiated that they would send us a bill, the guy who repaired it refused to leave unless he got paid for fixing the oven, so Hershey gave him 97 bucks and they reimbursed him. And, but I remember at this time thinking, first of all, is this really an honest access to information? It's a fishing expedition. And of course, then they didn't write a story saying, oh, we did an, ex we did a, an access to information request and we found out that, you know, Hershey Felder is, well, first of all, not only was he not taking money, but he was providing extraordinary services to the consulate. But, you know, it doesn't, <laughs> well, because he was running our kitchen, you know, uh, he was, he was performing for free. You know, we had Gino Quilico came. He wanted to do a concert, but we couldn't afford to hire a accompanist. My husband's a brilliant musician. He accompanied him as he was making things in the kitchen, you know, and all this and 97 bucks for his reimbursement. This is, shows you how corrupt we were. But anyway, the point I want to make is that when we're talking about access to information, we also have to talk about the, the framework around it. And just because governments may not like access to information requests, it doesn't always mean because they're trying to hide something. They really are disruptive. And we need to find ways. That's why the more open data we can get, the more things that people can simply access on a website without engaging people to put it together, the better it is. And I am not for a moment uh, advocating or supporting hiding or redacting information that has a legitimate public resonance into which people have a right. But one of the problems is that this is an expensive system. 
And we have to figure out how to make it work in the public interest in ways that are not unreasonably uh, draining on our financial resources. And I will tell you about FOIP. When I first came to the University of Alberta, I thought this was a new word, FOIP. And everyone was like, this will be FOIP, that'll be FOIP. And people are aware that people are going to be constantly making FOIP applications. And they govern themselves accordingly. You know, we don't communicate in a certain way because it makes a FOIPable communication. And it's not because what is being said is bad. It's because you just don't want to get into that kind of situation. So we need to think about this. And, I, and I, as I say, I'm not advocating people trying to get around the law, but I do think it's important to understand that none of these things is free. So we need to determine what needs to be known. Cabinet secrecy, very important, but we do know that cabinet documents will eventually be made public. And that is important, but the ability of people in a, around a cabinet table to communicate freely and openly before they come to some kind of decision really matters. And, you know, it doesn't mean that sometimes people don't leak, but what's interesting, in the Government of Canada, there is simultaneous translation at our cabinet meetings, and I am not aware of there ever being a leak by a translator. I think it's an extraordinary demonstration of integrity. That people understand that, and it makes it possible for Anglophones and Francophones to communicate. You almost forget that you're speaking two languages because of the skill of the translators. So there are some times when secrecy is actually quite justified because the results of the decisions must be made public. There cannot be, we, we, if we have binding agreements, if we have contracts, if we have treaties, these all have to be known. There is no justification for keeping those secret. But the process by which we get there, perhaps a certain privacy is, is appropriate. Then we'll just talk about technology. Technology, uh, gets more nano all of the time. And uh, uh, that provides great opportunities for us, but also poses enormous dangers. And again, going back to this question, how do you have privacy uh, when somebody can have a very small device that's recording everything? Uh, I remember when I was in cabinet, and again, this sounds like I'm gonna tell you about the days that I wore high button boots, but I remember when, when with Prime Minister Mulroney at cabinet one time, and there had been some scandals there was a scandal in British Columbia of the then Attorney General whose, whose car phone conversations with a, a lady who wasn't his wife uh, had been scanned by somebody and made public, and there was all a big scandal. And the Prime Minister, and some of my colleagues, particularly the ones from Montreal, who used to have their drivers take them to Montreal. Uh, I was from Vancouver, so I never had a driver outside of Ottawa. But they would be driving to Montreal, and what do you do in that two hours as they're driving to Montreal, and they get on the phone and often have indiscreet conversations, also often with women who are not their wives. But um, <laughs> anyhow, and then, but anybody who really wanted to could scan and pick them up. And I remember the Prime Minister saying, never say anything on your car phone that you wouldn't say with a reporter sitting beside you. But car phones, those days, that was very simple technology. But now, there's really, I think for people in public life, I think there really is almost no privacy because the technology and the intention are so, uh, you know, coming together are so potent that it is very, very difficult. You, you really have to be in control of a physical space to know that you're not going to have your picture taken by somebody's cell phone. It is just, you know, or that you're not going to be recorded. And we think of all of these examples, Mitt Romney's 47% comment, all of these things where somebody with very simple technology can do it. And this has totally changed things. And one of the things we talk about when we talk about protection of privacy, we talk about is there a reasonable expectation of privacy? You know, is somebody entitled to bring an action about breach of privacy because they expected this conversation or this situation to be private? And I think technology is dramatically changing what a reasonable expectation of privacy is. And I think, again, privacy is dead, get over it, um, maybe is the best uh, rule of thumb for anybody in public life who feels vulnerable to having things that they've said uh, repeated. And it doesn't necessarily mean you're saying bad things. It could be things taken out of context. It can be a throwaway line that you make to a friend, uh, but it gets picked up and suddenly becomes something totally different. So, oh, and, and, and another in, interesting example, talking about the technology. Uh, I saw a wonderful episode of House. And uh, maybe some of you watched the show House about this, you know, Asperger's syndrome doctor who is quite brilliant, but very, <laughs> not warm and cuddly. But anyway, in this, in this issue, a very attractive woman came in and she had a, an issue and they put her in the MRI and she went, ah, 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 because a microchip came out. Because normally anything magnetic you, wouldn't, you would take off. She didn't know that when she had breast implants, her husband had persuaded the doctor to put in a microchip so that he could track where she was going because he was a jealous husband. Now, 
this is very funny. You think, ha, ah, jealous husband, aha, ah, ah, serves right for having breast implants. Well, you know, you never know what they're going to put in you there. But the fact of the matter is, we now have these kind of technologies, and we all ought to go back and reread the dystopian novels of the 20th century, because the technology now exists to be able to track people, to be able to know what people are doing. So on the one hand, people say, well, nanotechnologies that can dig around your body and they can find tumors and they can report in on how your, your, you know, uh, your plaque is doing and whatever, and isn't that great? But maybe it can also tell people you know, where you are if you're trying to get away from oppressive uh, whatever or organized crime. I mean, I think we need to, we need to look about that. But there's also an interest, a, a way in which technology may threaten our act, access to information in the long term. And we heard about the importance of data and records management. But when I had had political retirement thrust upon me by the Canadian electorate, one of the first people who came to see me was the chief, Ar chief archivist of Canada. Now this is back in 1993. And he came to see me because he wanted me to give my papers to the National Archives, which I was happy to do. And I said to him, it must be really wonderful now having all of this electronic information. It must make it so much easier to accumulate information. And he said, no, it makes it harder. Because first of all, you have to keep the machines that can access the information at every iteration. Now, my first laptop was an IBM ThinkPad 350. You know, if you want to get access to information that's on that, you'd have to have something that could read that. Um, but also, this information, the, all the, you know, the days when people wrote letters and you had wonderful collections of, of correspondence between ministers and, uh, you know, it, it, Winston Churchill, I mean, his letters, and um, I was thinking of that funny, that funny joke about somebody uh, was circulating uh, a letter around the senior British ministry and somebody had looked at, at, a, at a comment in this document and really thought it was stupid and wrote, balls beside it. So the next person who got this thought that was not really very polite and crossed out the word balls and put round objects. <laughs> and the third person who got it crossed that out and said who is round and why does he object. But anyway, all of these, all of these things are lost because we don't have these, these, these papers anymore. But the fact of the matter is that we may be losing because as people are doing their emails, they're also doing their shopping lists. They're also arranging appointments to get their dogs groomed. So the archivists are faced with this huge, undifferentiated body of electronic information. And the question is, how can we make use of that? And how is that going to affect the access to information, not in the short term of holding governments accountable and finding out what they're doing, but in the longer term of understanding processes by which our policy has been formed, the history of our institutions, the kinds of things that we want to know, because access to information and records management is, is all about that as well. And technology is, is, can be our enemy as much as our friend. And it may result, I mean, you think of Hillary Clinton's emails. I was actually astonished to think that she could have emails that could get lost, because we're already to we're always told, you know, it's, and, you know, the internet is forever. It's not forever. And my husband and I were trying to find some old emails uh, apropos of a, of a land tra transaction, and we couldn't find them, and they weren't there. You know, my first email account was a number in CompuServe. You know, whatever happened to CompuServe? You know, RIP CompuServe, you're not around anymore. So, I think one of the things that's also really important is understanding that technology has its limits and that we have to understand how we can make sure that it does not prevent us from keeping information that we really need. And as the National Archive has said to me, acid-free paper is still the best uh, medium for preserving important information. Yes, it takes up room, but we know we have it. On the other hand, digitized data allows us to have open data, allows us to make things available to people, so there is a trade-off. Um, also, also paper things can be destroyed, and I remember once reading uh, how, you know, Jackie Onassis, before she died, she knew she was dying, and some friend came to see her, and she was sitting by the fire reading her old love letters from various suitors and throwing them into the fire, because she was determined nobody was going to see them, and, you know, the, the historian in you says, oh my gosh, this is terrible, wouldn't it be great to read them, and she said, yeah, over my dead body, I mean, and even after my dead body, you're not going to read them. So they can be destroyed, but the sheer volume of uh, electronic information may make information unavailable. Security, we have the questions of crime, we have the questions of, of uh, 
uh, act, uh, privacy with respect to an oppressive state. Um, we need protection against identity theft. Uh, uh, we hear frequent reports of commercial hacking. So all of these are things that are challenges, and many of you are engaged in these, the, both in terms of uh, policy and regulations, but also in terms of devices that law enforcement uses to try and respond to this, or not just law enforcement, but the companies themselves use to try and deal with them. Um, and then this is one of the hardest areas for trade-off and balance. Again, another television show I like to watch, and my sister got me onto this, is Dateline NBC. You know, it's the real cheesy stuff, but it's really great. Because it's all, my sister watches it because she's just mesmerized by the bad policing. <laughs> she was a prosecutor and she watches this and she's I can't believe they're doing this. And these idiots. Anyway, but so we watch it. But just the other day, I was watching a thing I'd recorded and somebody had, had murdered a woman and they had called her right before the crime on a, what they call a track phone, one of these throwaway cell phones. And what was very interesting was that they had the number of this cell phone on her phone, so they knew this phone had called her. And by that number, and by its serial number, they could track the store where it was sold, the manufacturer, the store was it was sold, where it was sold. The store where it was sold was a Walmart that had a security camera that was able, they were able through the computer records and stores now because they, they, all our purchases are highly computerized because it's how they do uh, inventory management as well as keeping track of, of cash transactions and to avoid people pilfering at the till. I mean, there's all sorts of reasons why our transactions are so deeply uh, dataized they actually could see the person who was buying this phone and thereby get the bad guy. So you think, well, that's really great. Um, after, you know, the, the bombings in London, people were concerned, you know, London has so many security cameras all over the place. CCTV is everywhere. And yet the fact that you could actually see and track people doing things, I mean, that's the good side of it. So that's one of the hardest things about the balance. You know, surveillance cam cameras as, as, a, as a, a weapon against terrorism. Um, I don't know how, how we cre create the balance. So the conclusion is there's no simple answers to the modern challenge of protecting privacy and assuring access to information. The key to all of this is strong democratic institutions and the rule of law. You are the key. You and the legislation and the regulations that you interpret, that you apply, you are the answer. There is no answer. We will never come up with a, a, a solution that says, okay, we've got to figure it out now. And every time we come up with a technological fix for hacking or whatever, criminals will find something else. Uh, people will find other ways of getting around it, so we have to constantly keep doing it. But this desire to protect privacy and keep secrets is, is old as time immemorial. During World War II, my mother was a Wren and she was a wireless operator and she tracked the, the messages of German U-boats in the North Atlantic and Gulf of St. Lawrence. And years later, she was in the Mediterranean, she met a German U-boat captain. And she sort of thought it was amazing that 20 years later, here they were having a drink together on the quay and she'd been trying to track him down and he'd been trying to you know, torpedo her ships. And she said to him, there was one message that we never could understand. It was, you know, did it did it did do do whatever it was in Morse code. And she said, and she asked him what it stood, what it meant, and he told her. And she said, Oh, that, we, we, we thought that might be it. But she said it was the weirdest thing to even be talking about it because the notion for secrecy was so important. That was a state secret. 20 years after the war, they could talk about it, but, it, but the, 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 the instinct was so strong. And this is an integral part of our life. We need secrets. We need state secrets. And the challenge is, how do we know what we should keep secret and what we shouldn't? The other question is, people may be prepared to sacrifice some of their democratic liberties and some of their privacy for security. And this is, I think, one of the big challenges that we face today. In 2005, the Club of Madrid convened the Madrid Summit, the Summit on Democracy, Terrorism, and Security, to mark the anniversary of the Madrid bombings. And many people said it was the largest gathering of security experts uh, in, in history, and it was an amazing thing, and heads of state and government were there, it was incredible experts, it was a remarkable gathering. And many people said that it was the conversation that should have taken place in the United States after 9-11. Because after 9-11 in the United States, there was not a public debate about what do we need to do to secure ourselves and preserve our liberties in the context of these new threats. 
in 2005 in Madrid, we had that conversation and we came up with a document called the Madrid Agenda and we're now talking about 10 years later reconvening that conversation. But next week, I'll be going to London for the board meeting of the International Center for the Study of Radicalization and Political Violence, which, which is at King's College in London. And it was a body created out of one of the recommendations of the Madrid Summit, which said, we need to know more about the process of radicalization. And ICSR has become one of the leading think tanks in this area, small but very good. And they've done very interesting works, work on, for example, radicalization on the internet. And there were many legislators, we advised the Home Office in Britain, the Department of Homeland Security in the United States, and the Government of Canada has also supported our work and been ac had access to it. Because one of the things that our expert analysis showed was that many of the steps that legislators wanted to take would be counterproductive, were not the things that people should do. So we need these kinds of conversations. We need people to actually look at the reality of issues, to know just to what extent we need to make those trade-offs. The controversy uh, over, over Bill C-51, I mean, people argue, I mean, there has been a lot of discussion about it. Has there been enough? Very difficult. On the other hand, an episode of The Good Wife, the law firm is hacked into by an online blackmailer who insists that they give it, they, who, who takes down their computers, you gotta give us $50,000. They pay the ransom, their computers are not restored. Law firm have to have our computers. So Kalinda, if you, if you watch The Good Wife, the Kalinda, the not too fastidious uh, researcher is able to identify where this is coming from and it's coming from a hacker in Russia. So they get on and they see him through his webcam. And he goes, ha, 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 if you make trouble with me, I'll just shut this down and start a new location. Galinda's not stupid, so all of a sudden, because she's got access to his computer, she's talking to him through his computer. All of a sudden you see pussy riot pictures, anti-Putin slogans, and this guy is scared out of his mind. Okay, 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 okay. So he gives them their money back and shuts it down, because in this case, a lack of internet freedom works in favor because this guy knows that internets are all being monitored and somebody's monitoring him. And if he has pussy ride and anti-Putin things on his computer, he's in trouble. So sometimes, uh, you know, the bad things work for good causes. So uh, my concern about all of this is that, this, that the generate about all of this is that, my final comment is that the generation that is most connected and that is, in a sense, redefining privacy, the young generation, is also not voting. If you look at the level of voter turnout in Canada, it is going down, and that decline is virtually all young voters. Us old geezers, we're still voting at the same rate. And what they need to understand is, as David Easton said, politics is the authoritative allocation of values. If we want to have legislation and policies that protect us, that create instruments and bodies to balance the ongoing struggle between our right to access to information, our right to privacy, and the other interests that occasionally conflict with them, we need a dynamic democratic structure. And so, Yes, privacy and access are very important for democracy, but democracy is essential for the protections of privacy and access. And that, I think, is the challenge. There are not easy answers. There are only processes that help us to balance our rights. There's no substitute for democracy. Thank you all for being part of that irreplaceable and incredibly valuable structure of democratic institutions, and we must all work on making sure that they can continue to survive and live, be appreciated and valued by Canadians. At the end of the day, democracy is the only answer. Thank you.